Great and Wondrous Mystery is a meditation on the coming of the Christian Messiah with texts quoted and paraphrased from prophetic Hebrew and Christian scriptures. The seven movements form a cantata for the liturgical season of Advent. These four weeks leading up to Christmas are a time of fasting, prayer, and self-examination during which the devout prepare themselves for the gravity of God-made flesh. It is traditionally a shorter counterpart to the season of Lent, the 40 days of fasting and prayer leading up to Easter. This cantata is intended to be performed with one movement flowing unbroken into the next. And two of the transitions are even marked ataka in the score, indicating a no-break immediate transition. The piece ends in a way intended to invite reflection and contemplation. So instead of commenting on the music as we go or at the conclusion, I will keep my comments to the beginning. First, by briefly discussing the background of the work, followed by a description of some recurring ideas to listen for. We'll then listen to the entire work performed by a virtual ensemble of amazing musicians to whom I'm deeply grateful. Each one of them rose to the challenge of remote, asynchronous recording with grace and incredible artistry. The title, Great and Wondrous Mystery, comes from an Armenian apostolic church hymn for the first day of Theophany which is Greek for a visible manifestation to humankind of God. Many Orthodox and Eastern Christians celebrate what we call Christmas on January 6th or 7th and the days following rather than on December 25th. And that is when theophany occurs in the Greek and other Orthodox churches. I was inspired by the text of this hymn, the way it poetically embraced the unknowable mystery of the story of this Messiah, and it was in a way that was more about awe and wonder, not really trying to explain everything intellectually or relying on the sentimental tropes common to a lot of Western Christmas and Advent carols. The idea of opening oneself to mystery is central to worship in many Eastern Christian traditions and many Eastern spiritual traditions in general. According to an Armenian Orthodox writer describing this hymn, rather than being a state of ignorance and lack of knowledge, Mystery is the beginning of worship. It's the place of awe where we realize our finitude within the shadow of God's vast glory and divine infinitude. It's the place where we dare not attempt to understand or grasp with our feeble and flawed minds, so instead we bow before him in worship. The mystery is the incarnation, Jesus Christ revealed among us, the Son of God, who became a human being in order to fulfill us with his divine blessings, with eternal life, so that we would become like him. The mystery is the reality of God with, among, and in us, end quote. The first time I heard this hymn was on an album titled Forty Martyrs, Armenian Chanting from Aleppo. And I picked it up at Hopscotch Coffee and Records in Winchester, Virginia, a fantastic local record store. Uh, released in 2015, commemorating the 100th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide. This recording is, according to historian and Fulbright scholar, Dr. Elise Samergian, a precious archive of one of Syria's ancient communities on what could be the eve of its extinction, end quote. The way in which the album came about and the circumstances in Aleppo today contrast markedly with the celestial spirituality of the, the chants therein. I highly recommend a story from NPR in 2015 for more backstory. And there's a link there on the screen where you can get more information and a link to that radio program. So here is the short version of the story of this album. In 2006 and 2010, Jason Hamacher, a punk rock drummer from DC, traveled to Syria to record religious chanting and take photographs in the ancient city of Aleppo, one of the oldest continually inhabited cities in the world. He was almost turned away by a deacon at the Forty Martyrs Armenian Apostolic Church. But when the very reverend Yeznig Zakanian walked by and expressed a willingness to be recorded right then, 
Jason rushed to his hotel to grab his equipment and the impromptu recording session began. In the empty sanctuary, he captured the unvarnished, unedited sound of the priest intoning hymns of praise for Easter, Christmas, and other parts of the liturgical year. Some of these chants are well over a thousand years old and barely survived the Armenian genocide a century ago. The story of Aleppo since then has been one of increasing destruction of loss. Lives, families, communities, homes, history, and culture. Even the 40 Martyrs Church compound itself was damaged by bombing in 2015 during the Syrian civil war, and Jason Homaker has not been able to make contact with Father Zakanian again. The city where people of different faith traditions and languages historically lived and created side by side crumbled into an unrecognizable shell of its former self. Aleppo, uh, an adopted homeland, a tolerant safe haven for generations of Armenians and people of other ethnicities and religious groups going back centuries. Well, that word Aleppo is now known more for multilateral violence and government on civilian terror rather than its cultural riches and its pluralistic past. The cantata, Great and Wondrous Mystery, is my attempt as a composer to musically and, and philosophically reconcile or try to synthesize in some way these two contrasting origins. On the one hand, we have the orthodox spirituality around Messiah's coming, with the embrace of mystery, the transcendent poetic ideas, all of them embodied in this lone priest's voice chanting texts and tunes, some of which might have survived 1,500 years or more. Uh, the chant titled Great and Wondrous Mystery from that 40 Martyrs album is a hymn text attributed to Moses Kertag, a saint in the Armenian Apostolic Church who is commemorated as one of the holy translators and remembered as the grammarian and creator of landmarks of Armenian literature and hymnody. According to Father Krikor Maskudian, who wrote a book on Armenia's patron saint, Gregory, the word translator doesn't actually convey the full meaning of the Armenian term, which, quote, had the meaning not only of translator, but also of commentator, narrator, writer, poet, rhetorician, historian, intellectual, and philosopher, unquote. In other words, the cultural intellectual milieu from which this music springs is aspirational. It's aiming for the highest ideals of human civilization beyond the mundane and the earth bound. These ancient chants lift the hearer's soul toward everything that the recent situation in war-torn Aleppo is not. And so, on the other hand, we have this harsh reality. We have a world torn by violent intolerance along lines of religion, ethnicity, and national origin, and political affiliation. We have this violence arriving at the literal doorstep of the Forty Martyrs Church, the edifice which since 1429 has been a home for ancient Armenian chanting and the transplanted people whose prayers they represented, whose refugee camps became permanent, vibrant neighborhoods. In pondering this dichotomy, the transcendent ancient spirituality versus violent current events, I reflected on sacred texts which my church reads during the four-week Advent season as we prepare for the joyful 12-day Christmas season. The prophets and the ordinary Jewish people behind these readings express plenty of otherworldly spirituality passed down through the ages, to be sure, but they're also speaking directly to the present needs and concerns of their immediate audiences the people in front of them at their own time. Many of these texts come from books which we refer to as Gospels. Gospel is a term derived from Old English, from a translation of a Latin term, and it literally means good news. So I wrote this cantata out of a simple conviction. If this good news about a Messiah is not good news that makes a practical difference, a practical difference in the lives of the people who live in places like Aleppo today, then it's not really good news at all. Viewed through this lens, the bracing challenges and warnings in these apocalyptic texts from the readings for Advent are still a bit scary, but they're also actually hopeful. When they warn of a coming righteous judge, they're about a judge to be feared by the oppressor, but eagerly awaited by the oppressed. The prophets and the Christ speak promises to encourage those who are persecuted, who are downtrodden, and who have been separated from the ones they love. 
these are promises and prophecies that, just like the old adage about a good sermon, should comfort the afflicted, but afflict the comfortable. For an example, let's consider the text of Mary's song of praise that's traditionally known as the Magnificat, which is the Latin verb in the opening line, my soul magnifies, Magnificat, my soul magnifies the Lord. She is pregnant with Jesus of Nazareth, and she sings with joy upon greeting her cousin Elizabeth, who's pregnant with his cousin, John the Baptist. At first, Mary's song might seem like a simple expression of humble gratitude from a young lady, and in the fourth movement of this cantata, I decided instead to focus on the portion of the text in which Mary boldly, and some might even say recklessly, proclaims the coming kingdom of God as a world-turning upside-down future, which gives the poor people like her hope, and it's cause for the rich powers that be to tremble. Imagine being Mary for a moment, a young, poor, unwed, teenage mother-to-be from an oppressed people group living on occupied land, and she is subversively prophesying about a God who cares about her needs more than the political elite. She sings these words, God has scattered those with arrogant thoughts and proud inclinations. God has pulled the powerful down from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. God has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty-handed. Had her words reached the ears of the reigning religious or political authorities, she might have been jailed or even executed on the spot for anti-government zealotry or even blasphemy. So she was a brave person. In the desert a few decades later, John the Baptist has gained a following by, paradoxically, admonishing his audience to, quote, produce fruit that shows you have changed your hearts and lives, end quote before the one who is even more powerful comes with the baptism of Holy Spirit and fire. It's a wonder he didn't chase more people away. <laughs> His followers were, not surprisingly, confused about exactly what are they supposed to do to prepare for this mystery Messiah. And John does not give them philosophical axioms to respond. Instead, he gets direct, down to earth and specific. And he says, whoever has two shirts must share with the one who has none. And whoever has food must do the same. And then he goes on to say things like, collect no more than you're authorized to collect. Don't cheat or harass anyone. So as we hear the cantata performed, I'll invite you to listen not just for those texts, but also for four aspects of the music in which they appear. Number one, in the vocal writing, listen for oblique motion between voices. That means motion in which one voice is staying on the same pitch and another voice is moving away from it or toward it. And also closely spaced voicings and voice crossing where a lower voice goes higher than an upper voice or vice versa. Number two, listen for speech rhythms and speech derived pitch contours. Number three, short melodic rhythmic cycles and beat displacement. And four, pan diatonicism and quick mode shifts. The first movement titled Aleppo, opens with a free-tempo, unmetered chant setting of the final lines from the canticle of Zechariah in the first chapter of the Gospel according to Luke. Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, speaks or perhaps sings this song of praise when his tongue is loosed after months of being unable to speak. We'll hear more of this canticle in Movement 3, which is named for Zechariah. Unlike monophonic plain chant, the chant in the first movement of this cantata is in a three-voice homorhythmic texture, mixing oblique and contrary motion among the voices. Much of the vocal writing throughout the work uses a similar texture, placing the three voices in a closely spaced middle register with identical rhythm and syllabification, obscures their individual timbre, keeping the listener unsure who exactly is singing and whether they are male or female, young or old, Let's listen to an example from the first movement, just the voices alone. As you can hear, the result is a purposefully androgynous ensemble sound. I am borrowing this technique from various other composers' vocal works in which a single dramatic voice is rendered by multiple singers. 
as is the case with the role of the evangelist, John, from Estonian composer Arvo Pert's setting of the St. John Passion. This single narrator role in the text is sung homorhythmically by four singers, a soprano, alto or cantor tenor, tenor, and bass. Their unified, genderless vocal timbre lends universality to the narrative voice. What we are hearing in parts Passio and in my cantata are words originally from the mouths of Zechariah and John and other prophets, words spoken mostly by older men from specific cultural contexts in specific historical places and times. However, the musical setting implies that the story being told is not just by and for them, but rather a story by and for everyone, regardless of gender or age or time period or location. I mentioned both the close registral proximity, that is, the way the vocal ranges are often written close to each other in pitch range, and also the frequent oblique motion between the voices, that is, the way they move in relation to one another when one voice remains on the same pitch, either a long note or repeated notes, while one or more other voices move. These two characteristics are also reminiscent of the tintinabili technique, which governs the pitch structure of Arvo Peret's mature sacred works. The name tintinabili comes from the Latin word for the ringing of bells, the same Latin root which gives us the English words tinnitus and also tintinabulation. Peret's signature compositional technique comprises a two-voice texture in which one contrapuntal voice moves mostly by step up and down the scale, like, like this, while a second voice sounds pitches from the tonic triad, so together they might sound like this. In describing how he left 12-tone composition behind and developed his Tintinabili style, Parrott said the following in an interview in 1988. I just wanted a simple musical line, internally alive and breathing, the way it had existed in the song of distant epochs, and still does in today's folk music, an absolute monody, a naked voice from which everything ensues. I wanted to learn how to lead the melody, although I had no idea that worked, how that worked. I had only one book on Gregorian chant, a Libru Swalis, which I received from a church in Tallinn. I began to sing and play those melodies with the same feeling I would have if I were having a blood transfusion. And somehow I was successful in connecting with that music, but I never used that proximity as a quotation, apart from one piece, which I wrote for the cathedral in Bologna. My aim is similar in that I'm hoping to connect the listener musically to that sense of simple, timeless melody using a texture and timbres that lend expansiveness and depth to the single melodic line. The ensemble breathes and moves like a single organism in these passages. Similarly to Pert, I usually avoid direct quotation of ancient chant music in this piece, with a couple brief exceptions. I believe very strongly that the chants and cultures which inspired this piece, the chants from the 40 Mar... 40 Martyrs album and other similar ancient chants, they stand on their own. They don't need me to rewrite them. This cantata is inspired by and pays homage to the Armenian chanting we hear on this album, but doesn't so much directly reference it for most of the work. Let's listen to an example of a Tintinabili inspired vocal texture from the fifth movement of the cantata, John. Listen for how the voices take turns serving as either the stepwise melody or repeatedly sounding the tonic and the fifth scale degree. So that would be do and sol in a major scale or minor scale. Then John said to the crowds who came to be baptized by him, prepare the way for the Lord. So, for an example of the second and third aspects of the music, which I invite you to listen for, let's look a bit later in that fifth movement. Ever since I wrote my first one-act opera, Overtones, I've tended to write vocal lines based on speech rhythms and speech-derived pitch contours, so to musically interpret spoken text in a way that feels hopefully natural and inevitable, but also brings a strong point of view compositionally. 
I also enjoy playing with short melodic rhythmic cycles and beat displacement, or displacing the hearer's expectation of where the beat is in relation to the meter, both to further amplify the natural speech rhythms and to engage the mind and body by setting up metric expectations, maybe where a downbeat is, and then introducing elements of surprise. Whenever we speak, whenever we humans talk, and even when we whisper, our voices use pitch expressively. Most of the time we aren't even consciously doing so, but if someone's voice suddenly becomes lower, or suddenly higher, or starts low and becomes high, those pitch changes have various explicit and implicit meanings, right? They sound darker or more unsure, or more excited, more like a question, more like a statement. And those meanings also depend on culture and language. So in terms of rhythm and meter, the words and syllables that we emphasize and de-emphasize when we're singing a text in music, and those words or syllables which we elongate or we keep very short, those choices also impart meaning. The passage I already read in which John the Baptist admonishes his audience to care for those who are in need was central for me to the meaning of the entire work, the whole cantata. It is the concrete and the down-to-earth, tangible response that seems worthy of both the mystery and majesty of the Messiah and the urgency of human need in the present moment, both when John said those words and today. I knew I wanted the voices in that part of the piece to almost stand alone, nearly unadorned by any other instruments. So I spoke the text out loud to prepare, listening for how my voice rose and fell in pitch and for the natural rhythms and emphases or de-emphases in my speech. So like this. Who has two shirts must share with the one who has none. Who has two shirts must share with the one who has none. Whoever has food must do the same. Whoever has food must do the same. I chose to repeat some of this text in the music, both to emphasize its importance, but also because I wanted to highlight multiple different ways of interpreting the text, and thereby multiple ways that John could have said it, or that we could say it to ourselves today. Perhaps the most important thing is for those who have food or shirts to be thankful and be generous, or perhaps the most important thing is just for those who have to share with those who don't have or for whoever to be generous, anyone, anywhere, anytime. There are multiple ways to think about the text, and I think multiple of them are valid. So I said it in a way that invites the listener to reflect and to hear the words fresh, even if they've already heard this passage countless times throughout their lives. These short cycles of text also create rhythmic cycles, which I purposefully choose to place and then displace in relation to the meter, in relation to where the downbeat is. A similar method of setting up downbeat-related expectations and then playing with them recurs throughout the work, creating a sense of rhythms that float both with but also above the steady beat and the steady meter, rhythms that dance freely over a bed of ostinatos of short repeated musical ideas and repeated notes, whether or not they line up consistently with the downbeats. Let's listen to another example of these short melodic rhythmic cycles and beat displacement as well as an example of that last fourth thing, pan diatonicism and quick mode shifts. Back in the fourth movement, named for Mary, after an aleatoric opening passage of unmetered layered chanting, the organ begins a repeated seven beat long figure in the bass, played by the pedals, which sounds like this. Over top of that, we have a two-beat cycle of oscillating eighth notes. And these occur in the context of a four-beat meter, four-quarter time. Therefore, these ostinatos not only coincide on the downbeat once every 28 beats, the least common multiple of that seven beat low bass pedal cycle on the four beat measure, but most of the time these rhythmic ostinatos don't line up with each other. So they m mostly move by step up and down the scale to create a sense of smooth voice leading in the individual contrapuntal lines, but, but they don't need to line up with each other's phrases. 
This kind of free, mostly stepwise motion by multiple independent lines in a diatonic scale is an example of what the composer and author Nik Nicholas Slonimsky called pandiatonicism. It's a way of freely using the diatonic scale without regard for whether the vertical sonorities line up according to traditional harmonic practices from the common practice period. And you hear it very commonly in the music of composers like Aaron Copland and uh, Igor Stravinsky. To make things more interesting, I've inserted frequent unpredictable mode shifts that serve to keep the listener and musicians on their toes about what might happen next, and also to paint the text that the soprano soloist is singing. This movement takes its words from Mary's song, the Magnificat, that we talked about earlier. So, for example, when the text moves from in the depths of who I am to God has lifted up the lowly, the mode of that cycling accompaniment suddenly shifts upward by a whole step, and the sense of tonic in the vocal line goes with it. While it's common to shift a church hymn upward by a half or a whole step at a climactic verse, it's not as common to shift downward, and it's not as common to shift unpredictably at different points. And I wanted to experiment with these kind of quicker, unprepared direct modulations and common tone modulations in a sacred work. Meanwhile, the freely pandiatonic contrapuntal interaction and the metric non-alignment of the cycles in the accompanying parts, and also in the melody, they create this bed of moving sound. It's like a groove in jazz, Afro-Cuban, or rock music. So the intent is for the whole ensemble, and especially the soloist, to sound like their music is a form of dance, a, a type of improvisation-esque, personally expressive dance in which the perpetual motion of the group unshackles each individual from needing to consciously keep track of, okay, where's the downbeat? Where's the measure? Where's the strong beat? Where's the weak beat? The dance just is, and it doesn't need to fit into linear, predictable metric time scales. One more thing to listen for. In the sixth movement, Simeon, you'll hear first a mostly a cappella soprano passage, which sets text from the Canticle of Simeon. This is also known by the Latin name Nunc Dimittis and has been set by countless composers through the ages. For centuries, this text has also been part of evening prayer liturgies or even, even song, Compline, Vespers, from a variety of Christian traditions, beginning with those words, Now, Master, you let your servant go in peace. You dismiss your servant in peace. In the Bible, in the Gospel according to Luke, Simeon was an old man awaiting the coming of the Messiah, and it had been revealed to him that he wouldn't die until he saw Messiah's coming. So he spoke or perhaps sang this song of praise to express his joy and his thankfulness that he lived to see the boy Jesus. However, he also issues a prophecy about how Jesus will turn the world upside down. He says to the boy's mother Mary, This boy is a sign to be the cause of the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that generates opposition, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your innermost being too. After the soprano sings the words, The falling and rising of many, listen for this gradual build up, this, this gradual crescendo of electronic effects, delay, echo, and also reverb with an extremely long decay and kind of granular synthesis type sounds that depict Simeon's words echoing into the future through Jesus' tumultuous life in the coming years and his death, and then down through the ages, through all of those who have sung his words at night since. Finally, as the piano improvisation reaches a climax and then begins to subside, you'll hear hints of the one and really the only direct quotation from the Armenian chanting that I heard on the 40 Martyrs album. It's from the track, Great and Wondrous Mystery, from that chant. And it's a brief but striking melody, which you'll hear first hinted at in the piano improvisation, and then again in the seventh and final movement, which is also called Great and Wondrous Mystery. The timbre that I chose for this melody, the tone color, comes from the combination of unison saxophone and violin, but they're playing this ornamented melodic line, so they're not always perfectly in time on the grace notes, on purpose, and they blend to form this different timbre, something reminiscent of an ancient woodman instrument from the Near East. 
This choice of instrumentation was inspired by a piece called 70,000 Assyrians, a tour de force wind ensemble work by my college and grad school composition teacher, Dr. Paul Barsom. A striking moment in that piece comes when the solo saxophone and trombone sound the mournful strains of an Armenian folk song. Paul couldn't find any Assyrian folk songs because that people group does not survive to this day, but reaching back into his own heritage, he looked into Armenian folk song. Um, and it's in that work, it's not really in unison, but more in a heterophony. I was amazed as a young composer hearing this and following along in the score, how these two instruments, two instruments so familiar, saxophone and trombone, they could sound like a completely new and other instrument when they were layered in this highly ornamented melodic style. This cantata is dedicated to all those who lost their lives or their communities in Aleppo and other places like it, and to those who defiantly survived and make a life in those places to this day. I have been both awed and humbled these past few years to see images of people still celebrating Christmas and other holidays in Aleppo, sometimes quite literally in the midst of the rubble. I hope that this music can both honor and celebrate them and inspire us all to learn more and care more about people who might be geographically distant from us, but with whom we share a bond of human family.